Good afternoon and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Martin Jacobs, I'm from PwC and it's my pleasure to chair this afternoon's event on uh, new models and ways of working in government. This is the third in a series with the Institute for Government uh, entitled The Future Shape of Whitehall. Uh, we've had lots of interest uh, in today's uh, topic and uh, from a, a look at the list uh, of all of your names uh, attending today, there's a very good mix of the public sector, private sector, uh, and, and third sectors. In fact, could I just ask, if, if you're from the public sector, could you just confess so we can get a sense of who is here? And if you would classify yourself as <laughs> private sector? Third sector? <laughs> and and uh, press and other commentators, was useful to know. Thank you very much, well welcome. <laughs> Um, so, as government seeks greater effectiveness uh, and efficiency in the way of working, um, and we come to consider new models uh, in the evolution of, 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 of government operations, now pertinent to ask the question, what, what sort of models are being anticipated by uh, different government departments? What are, what are the hurdles to implementing these, these models and getting them in place? And how, how do you make them effective in working? And so I'm delighted today to introduce our very excellent panel to uh, discuss this, this topic. Um, John Thompson, who is Permanent Undersecretary at the Ministry of Defence. Uh, Ed Welsh, who is D Executive Director for Transformation at the Cabinet Office. Antonio Romeo, uh, Director General at Criminal Justice Group at the Ministry of Justice. And Tom Gash, uh, who's from the... Um, uh, uh, Institute for Government and leads work on public sector markets and commissioning. So the way we're going to take today is I will ask each of the panel members to talk for five minutes or so uh, on the theme of, of new business models. We will have uh, a brief discussion uh, amongst the, the panel uh, af after 20, 25 minutes um, uh, to, to uh, distill the themes that are coming out and then I will open that to yourselves. The intention of today is to keep it reasonably informal. Uh, it's a panel discussion, but the more we can involve yourselves in the audience, the, uh, the happier we will be uh, to do so. Um, and I will try and facilitate that so that we bring um, some interesting conclusions um, out by a close at around two o'clock. So um, without more ado, Ed, could I ask you perhaps to commence proceedings and talk um, from the Cabinet Office perspective on new ways of working? Sure. So I wanted to give a general perspective on what we're trying to do out of the Cabinet Office. And I know John and Antonio will talk about specific projects that they're undertaking in, in their departments. So within the Cabinet Office, we have a team which is called the Commercial Models Team. And as the name suggests, it does focus on introducing commercial elements into ways of working in government. Now, while it's true that this often involves the introduction of a new partner, from the private sector, that's not always the case. So in local government, we have seen nearly 100 mutuals which have been established with the support of, of the Cabinet Office. None of those have a private sector partner in them. They've all been supported to spin themselves out, providing pretty much exactly the same services that they're currently providing, but put themselves into a new entity and under a contract, provide those services back to the entity that previously they worked for. So there's no involvement in the private sector, and that's all about just empowering the individuals to make what is normally a large number of very small decisions that when they add up, make a real difference in terms of the quality of service and ultimately their capacity to, to deliver that service. In central government, uh, it tends more often to be with the involvement of the private sector um, so we tend to look at two situations, one where there's a need for transformation of a service, maybe because of digital enablement that means there needs to be an operational transformation behind that, or maybe because of growth. So many, many entities within government we find have the potential to grow commercial revenue, bring income into government, but also take a capability out into the market as well and help the broader uh, economy. 
So across central government, we have quite a number of examples of, of transformation uh, in Department of Health. Going back a few years, they established a joint venture on back office services. That's been a bit of a theme. Uh, I suspect John will pick up what's been done in Defence Business Services, which is uh, a management insertion contract, somewhat different construct. And then in central government, uh, back end of last year, we established Shared Services Connected Limited, which is a joint venture providing those back office services to 13 departments. And that was established as a, as a joint venture. So in each of those, we have the private sector acting as a catalyst for transformation, but in somewhat different structures. Turning to growth, I mean, again, one can go back many years and look at structures and, again, thinking about Ministry of Defence, um, go back to Kinetic, which um, at its heart was a tra transaction enabling growth, so taking the capability that existed in that organisation and finding ways to drive commercial revenue. We see that in a small way in some of the, the venture um, services which are happening in MOD, in MOJ, there's an initiative to establish a company selling UK's expertise in rehabilitation services internationally. Fantastic, just taking that core capability and bringing in income externally. In the Cabinet Office last year, we established a joint venture called Axelos, which took some intellectual property that had been developed for the benefit of government, put it in a structure that incentivised growth. We forecast uh, and we continue to remind our partner that that will bring in total revenue of 500 million over the next seven years. And we also had an initiative called Energy for Growth that took a percentage of government's power requirements, which we can predict relatively long term, and used that to support a new renewable plant in the northeast of England. So very directly taking part of government spend, in no way increasing that spend, but using it as a catalyst for a significant investment in the northeast of, of England. So, lots of good things happening, but just turning to challenges, why aren't more of these things happening? So the challenge is not in finding suitable opportunities. I think everywhere we look, we find significant number of opportunities. And it's not in finding the private sector that wish to engage in this. Again, they're very willing. Sometimes they take uh, a bit of convincing that we are actually trying to do something different. I mean, we've trained them quite well over many years, so we have to untrain to a certain extent, but that's, again, not really the challenge. The challenge is really in reaching consensus and maintaining consensus throughout a transaction. Wh when I try and examine what that is, and there are probably multiple causes, but th there's clearly an element of thinking that doing something new is inherently saying that what has been done previously is poor, wrong, bad. So it's seen as an attack to a certain extent. And that's not really the case. I mean, going back to the two drivers for most of what we're doing in central government, is either transformation or growth. Transformation is necessarily a periodic event, so it would be unusual for an organisation to have that capability just on tap to do a transformation. And equally, in terms of growth, very often we haven't asked or indeed engendered in any way a management team and the employees to grow an organisation. So it would be odd if they had that capability. So it's bringing in capability in two circumstances which aren't normal within central government. But I think it also requires um, a bit of a leap of faith. So we don't have <coughs> excuse me, a huge amount of evidence demonstrating that each of these models is the best way to do something. We are getting more evidence um, over time. So the first one that was done out of the Cabinet Office was just about two years ago, my CSP, joint venture established with a private sector partner taking 40%, government 35%, and an employee benefit trust 25%. And now we're just beginning to see the evidence of increased productivity, excuse me, increased productivity, um, increased employee satisfaction, and increased uh, customer satisfaction. So some pleasing evidence, but there is clearly a lack of um, large uh, evidence base to, uh, to support all of that. I'll just briefly, uh, so it's not take too much time, just turn to success factors. I think the first point is a structure needs to stand on its merits. This can't be about doing a model, a change for the sake of it. 
There has to be a very good reason for it, and there has to be good, clear, objective thought as to what the right model is to do it. Secondly, I think it's important to separate government's role as customer and as shareholder, uh, which is often the case in, in these initiatives. They should be achieving very different things in those two roles, and we need to make sure that they are separated and thought about very clearly. And I think the third area is there needs to be a management which is receptive and very often driving this change. So they may not be the initial catalyst for it, but they have to own the change very often when we go through a transaction. One of the smallest transactions we did in central government was over the behavioral insights team earlier this year. Small team, policy unit. We're very pleased we did it because it's the first policy unit that, that has spun out. But that was very much driven by the management and all of the employees saying that we're not currently in a structure that allows us to give the best to government, which is our main customer. We need to be freer so that we can go out, see what other people are doing, do contracts for commercial organisations as well as other governments and bring that expertise back. So we hope to do a lot more of these. We have uh, a strong pipeline, some of which are public. Um, so I think uh, today there's a supplier event looking at the Idea Assurance programme. Tomorrow there's a supplier event looking at Crown Hosting, which is uh, aggregating the hosting requirements of, of, of government. Um, we are out in the market now for a partner for debt collection services across government. And there are a lot more which aren't currently public, but uh, are very much in the pipeline. Ed, thank you very much. John, could I ask you to pick up the baton from there? Sure, uh, love to. So first of all, can I say thanks very much for inviting me along. Uh, and the Ministry of Defence um, is an organisation which has a long history of trying to think about problems in a very innovative uh, way, really. Uh, we spend about £400 million a year on pure research and about £1.7 billion or thereabouts on research and development. But of course, all of that money is trying to tackle uh, a military challenge. It's trying to think about how do we bring a particular military effect to a particular problem. You know, how do we more innovatively uh, deliver military effect on the battlefield? Uh, but we've never really, I don't think, until a few years ago, thought about, well, how do you bring that way of thinking to the way that we run our organisation? Are there other different ways that we can think about how we run our organisation, how we approach business problems? We think about it very clearly in a military space. And whilst you know the public manifestation of military capability is smarter ships or new missiles and whatever, actually the methodology does fundamentally require military colleagues to think more fundamentally about what is the effect that you're trying to bring. And they do do significant work in that space and pure research. But from the permanent secretary's perspective, the question really is how do you apply that kind of way of thinking to the way we run our organisation? And we did quite a lot of work uh, with Lord Levine's group in 2011, 2010, 2011. We had the great benefit of an external review that said, well, you know, the, you've run the organisation in a particular way for a, uh, for a long time. Does that, does that really square? So we had some external stimulus. But we also had a defence board, I think, which had taken the corporate governance code that the government had laid down and really thought very carefully about what was the role of the board in terms of leading the strategy of the organisation. And we did a lot of work on what was our long-term operating model. What was, the f what, what was the Ministry of Defence fundamentally did it have to do itself and where could it explore uh, very innovative uh, ways of working? And we spent quite a lot of time on this. What was core and fundamental? And where could we explore different ways of working? And what I think we were trying to do, really, was to try and blend together the, the best of the public sector with the best of the private sector. How do you get the right blend through a different range of functions? Um, and what that's led us to is a fairly significant programme of different ways of, of working. And, and I'll come back to the example of the Defence Business Services, which was the really the first real public manifestation of that. Um, but it has led to us deciding to keep, keep some functions and retain them in-house and do some, in, some initial work, all the way through to full outsourcing and the involvement in the private sector. But I think the heart of, of what you were trying to get at in this seminar was the, I think there are a significant number of options now between the old traditional in-sourcing, outsourcing debate. And we tried to explore those as much as possible. And the, and the one clear deal that we did as a pathfinder was Defence Business Services. Two and a half thousand people providing corporate enabling services. We have a stable baseline of cost and a stable baseline um, of performance. And we want to try and unlock some value in that. We want to try and reduce the cost 
and we want to try and improve the performance, but we don't have the tools to do it ourselves. And how do we inject the capacity and capability from somewhere else to try to think about the problems in, in different ways? And in the end, we went to the market for a leadership team and a change management team in a consortium, which was injected into running, taking over the executive management of the organization, a relatively small team, and they were paid putting it fairly uh, frankly, on a kind of no win, no fee basis. They didn't save us any money, they didn't get paid. If they couldn't keep up the KPIs, then there were financial penalties for them in doing that. But it has resulted in Serco, Accenture and Mood, a combination of those three organisations, thinking through the fundamentals of that organisation and radically changing the way in which it delivers services within the Ministry of Defence. As I said, no win, no fee. It saved us about 30% of the cost in the first two years, £78 million. Pounds. Now, I don't think personally that we would have been able to unlock that value, and actually the performance has improved. So as far as the, co the customers of that function are concerned, they have a better performance, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, I have a lower cost. So it seems to have unlocked both of those dimensions for us um, as an organisation. And as I said... We think it proved that this principle could be adopted. We just doubled the size of it by adding in some further functions. And we used it, I think, as a, as a springboard to look at much more significant uh, functions within the MOD. So we have announced, we did announce in February that we had struck a deal with uh, Capita, URS and PA Consulting to run our infrastructure business. Now, that is on a completely different scale. Three and a half billion pounds a year that we spend on our infrastructure business. The Ministry of Defence owns or controls 1% of the total land mass of the United Kingdom, which is a fairly significant land holding. And what we wanted was, well, how do I unlock value from that estate? How do I innovate? And again, we've done pretty much the same deal. We haven't quite signed, I can see Richard uh, McCarthy over there. Uh, we haven't quite signed on the bottom line, but we've announced that we're gonna do that deal. You know, it's in the pipeline. That, I think, will, will give us a completely different way of thinking about our infrastructure, a different way of working, the injection of capacity and capability in the private sector, but fundamentally still a public sector organisation. Everyone pretty much remains a civil servant, working within civil service, but they get the innovation and the injection of, of additional capacity. I, I want to thirdly just mention, uh, because, uh, because you're the chairman specifically, I think, uh, the way in which we try to engage the big four. We, we've um, pretty much tried to switch off the kind of traditional way of working with big four colleagues of, of what's called shelf, where I ask you to how I tackle the problem, you tell me what, how much, it, uh, you tell me how to, to address the problem, and then I pay you some money, and then you walk away from it. And I just didn't think that was really good enough. And what we've been able to develop with big four uh, con and other consultancies is a way in which they're actually then involved in the delivery. They actually get their hands stuck in the mangle, take responsibility within the management structure for the delivery of what are undoubtedly good ideas. Um, but I think that is a different way of working. We've struck some very long-term deals um, with some consultancies where we don't simply take their advice. We say, okay, fine, we'll go and turn it into some reality then. You know, here's control of this particular function or a partnership or a joint venture or whatever. And I think that's uh, also a good way in which to use uh, consultants and others. I think just one other thing I want to mention, because it's a particular passion of mine, and I know there are some of my employees here, I, all of this kind of thinking about new ways of working on a grand strategic level is fine, and about organisations, but fundamentally, for every single person who works in the Ministry of Defence, the question is, how do I make their experience better every single day? How do those little tiny incremental changes in the organisation really make a difference over time? And it seems to me that you have to build it up, uh, and we've tried to build it up in three different ways. We've had a a red tape challenge. What are the most frustrating things of the organisation and how do we remove those from your everyday experience? Secondly, how do we improve the technology that you get? Your everyday experience of booting up and it taking 38 minutes to do so before you can access all of you. And how do you remove all of those frustrations of working with technology? And thirdly, because it's a great thing for me, the Ministry of Defence has, has developed a kind of pulse, internal policy landscape which has taken bureaucracy to a, a completely new level, it seems to me, on the UK economy. And uh, we have to strip all of that bureaucracy around. You know, the rule set that we try to uh, get people to apply to is too much. And a combination, in my head at least, a combination of removing all of the things that you have to comply with, plus giving you technology, and then removing all of those individual frustrations of the day of having to do every single thing in a particular kind of way, a kind of daily grind of bureaucracy. Some combination of those three ought to make the lives 
of every single member of staff in the Ministry of Defence better every day over a long period of time. And that isn't, doesn't fit with some kind of grand, huge new ways of working, but it does make a difference to every single person all the time. And I've made that a particular passion of mine. So there you go. John, thank you very much. Some fantastic themes coming out of uh, Antonia. Thank you, and, and thanks for inviting me to talk today. Um, so a bit of context first. In MOJ, we're taking 30% out of our budget in five years, um, which means we essentially have two choices. We either uh, really retrench our service delivery or we look at new and innovative ways of doing things and we try and transform our service provision in the context of that reduced budget. So we have a very radical programme of reforms um, across all our business, which is prisons, probation, <coughs> courts, legal aid, and the CJS as a whole. Um, and we're looking to essentially focus those reforms on driving innovation through service delivery while protecting core services and in collaboration with partners to ensure that we remove duplication and gaps um, in our service provision. So to do this, really, we want to adopt an outcomes-centric, a user-centric approach, um, work in partnership across all sectors, so as well as the public sector, the private and voluntary sector, um, and as well, change the way we work. So this links in with some of the things that John was saying at the end. So work differently. How can we open up our policy making? How can we adopt a more agile approach um, to technology and, and digital in that, in that service delivery? So I thought I would focus on um, what is our biggest and highest priority uh, program, which is transforming rehabilitation, which is essentially delivery, uh, essentially design and delivery of an entirely new model for rehabilitation and probation services. So, all, as always, start with, you know, what's the problem you're trying to fix? Nearly half of all adult offenders leaving prison re-offend within a year. <coughs> this number rises to 60% if you look at those offenders who are um, in custody for less than 12 months. So there's clearly a significant challenge there um, that we want to address. These are offenders with really complex problems. So over um, a quarter of them have been in care, a number of them have um, drug and alcohol problems. Um, these are issues that can't be fixed just within the, the confines of, of what MOJ can do. We really need to bring together the expertise across um, private and voluntary sectors as well, um, and across uh, all different sort of sectors and, and um, of the in, within that whole space to improve outcomes for these people. So our objectives in transforming rehabilitation are to open up the market um, for delivery of probation services, um, to extend rehabilitation and supervision provision to those um, who are sentenced for less than 12 months who currently get no statutory probation provision, and to improve uh, resettlement of prisoners, what we call through the gates, so before they leave custody as well as once they're out in the community. So it's a complex and, and multi-dimensional programme. It taps into all the things that have already been talked about in, the con in terms of um, you know, outsourcing, um, different methods of, of, of paying by results and so on. We are restructuring the 18,000 strong uh, probation service into a national probation service to deliver services to high-risk offenders and to 21 community rehabilitation companies um, to deliver uh, rehabilitation services to medium and low-risk offenders these community rehabilitation companies will be copied out uh, to the private and voluntary sector. We are establishing a new market for provision of these services um, at, with a very diverse and rich supply chain. So we want to have um, voluntary sector organisations and mutuals themselves, um, so probation uh, trusts, essentially staff who have mutualised, uh, to be providing at all levels in that supply chain, so at what we call tier one as well as further down the supply chain. We are putting in place an incentive-based payment by results system, so what John described as no win, no fee, um, where we will, uh, we, which will really encourage innovation and focus minds on outcomes. And we're also undertaking to support this, the biggest reorganisation for the prison estate in a generation, which will create uh, 90, about 90 uh, resettlement prisons, such that we can really ensure that we are uh, rehabilitating people um, while they're in custody and then right down in, through as they leave and into their community. So what's innovative about this? Um, well, we've got, as I mentioned, new payment by results um, incentives. So essentially, we say to you, you will have, as a provider, you will have the discretion and the flexibility um, to, uh, to design, the, to determine what interventions you are going to use to rehabilitate people, but we will uh, pay you for what works in reducing reoffending, at, at least in part. 
Um, to make this work, providers need to have information and data on what does work. So we've established something called the Justice Data Lab, which we've been piloting for a year, um, which creates a landscape of shared knowledge and expertise um, in reductions in reoffending. It tells providers, and well, indeed anybody working with offenders who, who submits to us their, uh, the detail of who they've been working with, how effective their interventions are. And over time, we will be uh, publishing, collecting and publishing this information. So we'll really be creating a culture of best practice and also of transparency, um, which will help generate um, further innovative approaches. We are, secondly, we're opening up the market, um, as I say, to a, to a very diverse provision, um, not just down in the supply chain, but at tier one as well. And to support this, um, we have got, and we're working, Helen Stevenson's here in the audience, who runs the um, Office of Civil Society, and we're working closely with the Cabinet Office to ensure um, that we're providing um, millions in funds, and we've over a million has already gone out in grants to support uh, VCSE organisations, even those smaller ones, to really prepare themselves for, um, for, op for bidding for and operating in these contracts. Um, we have also created a register for second and third providers of VCSE. So what this does is it allows them to market themselves to the tier one providers. So we're not just worrying about our, the people that we will have a direct relationship with, but we are trying to essentially create an entire market um, for service provision that will be truly diverse and, and encourage innovation. Um, and we're also building capability, so working with Akivo and MCVO and others to build capability um, of these organizations. Um, and finally, I mean, on, on in terms of one of the most innovative parts of this, uh, and Ed's team have been very involved in this, we are um, seeking to level the playing field so that mutuals can um, bid for and win some of these contracts at the highest level. So there's a mutual support team in, in Cabinet Office whose job it is essentially to ensure that these mutuals have the capability and the support they need um, to compete for these contracts. This is a programme that is mid-flight, but it w what, what strikes me as the key success measures so far um, are, first of all, focusing on the outcome, not the input. So ensuring that um, you really know what it is that you're trying to achieve and then worrying about contracting on that. So uh, connected with that, we believe strongly, is building diversity in the supply chain. These are not issues that we can all um, define and, and deliver ourselves. And we need to recognise that often the voluntary and the private sector can be more innovative or more agile in their responses to, um, to the results they see coming back and how we can work, bring together essentially the best of the public, voluntary and private sector to, to deliver this. Um, I do think there's a key challenge here that we might come on to um, on what is our capability and capacity as the civil service, as the public sector, to be the intelligent commissioner of these, because of course the more you compete out your services, the more you have to uh, be the intelligent customer, if you like, to those contracts. Um, Secondly, working in partnership to deliver the model. So consulting widely, I think, is an essential part of this. We consulted widely in the Transforming Rehab programmes and we listened and actually adapted our model based on what um, people said in response to that consultation. And then shadow running, so ensuring that within the public sector, while you still own um, the model that you're, you're designing, you're in the process of designing, that you test it constantly and you assure yourself of how it's going to work and you're talking to all your partners, so in our case, PCCs, um, local authorities to ensure you're getting the right, um, uh, that you're designing the right model before you actually award the contract. Um, avoiding silos and service delivery, so putting in place incentives for collaboration, so we're actually designing into our contracts and, and into the bids. Uh, bid providers have to tell us how they are going to sustain effective partnerships at a local level, because that's where rehabilitation really, where the rubber hits the road, is at the, at the local level. Um, Fourthly, gathering and publishing the right data. So as I say, in order to know, I mean, when you're paying by results, you've got to get a really good agreement over what that data is that you're actually going to pay on, but also more widely, how you can, how you can promote innovation through getting, uh, sharing that information and the data about what works to really promote best practice. Um, and finally, I think really focusing on the priorities. And this is perhaps true across what we're doing in the whole of MOJ. I've described one uh, one program where we've got a, a new and ambitious um, model so market, if you like, um, that we're bringing in. But actually, you know, this is one of five priority programs, but what you've really got to do in a world of scarce resources <coughs> identify where you're going to put your energy and your funding and then focus just on those five things rather than try and uh, perhaps reform everything at the same time. I hope this is a good lesson in life. Thank you. Tom. 
Okay, so I'll try and continue the upbeat theme a little, but then I'll uh, inject a few sort of notes of caution around uh, new models in public services. Um, and I'm going to do that based on the research that we've done in the Institute over the last five years or so, looking at what we call public service markets, effectively, because um, whether or not it's a, a mutual or a outsourcing model to a big private sector provider, as people would call, or people now call them traditional outsourcing, um, there's going to be a contract somewhere at some point, and at some point in time, you're going to have to have a competition to win that work again, otherwise you just have a big fat private sector monopoly, and that's not the place we want to end up. So the, the benefits first from the research, and I'm going to start with by, uh, by talking rubbish. Um, people who know me may say that's, that's not new, but um, the, the thing is that we've got very little research about what actual impact on public services it has when you do go for a contractual model of provision. And the best uh, evidence we do have does relate to the outsourcing of rubbish in the 1980s and 1990s. And there we have pretty, pretty good evidence that it, that it actually made a difference. Um, there was an improvement in quality, partly because that's not what people were driving for in the 1980s. It was very much driven by a desire to get efficiency. And the efficiencies that were gained, according to some of the best research I've seen on the topic, is around 20 and 30% savings. And that's a number that bats around a lot and resonates, I think, a bit with some of the things we've heard from the panel who've actually done this stuff. Um, the, the, in other areas, though, we don't have the robust evaluations. We have some of the, the feel, the, so, so the, the, the finding that people who've gone through the experience themselves, what they've said has worked for them. And what they've actually said is the process of thinking differently about how you deliver service, what service delivering, the outcomes you're trying to generate, in itself is very, very valuable. And the ways in which it seems to have been most valuable is in improving the quality of information on which decisions are made and on which performance is judged, rewarded, and incentivized. Because as soon as you've got to uh, reward someone based on their performance, you, you suddenly get very interested in making sure you actually know how good someone's performance is. And I think this, is, this has been transformational in a number of areas. And um, one area where I think we have some of the strongest uh, evidence now around performance of different operational units, as it were, right, might be in prisons. And that was something that was, again, very contested at the time, um, but actually uh, managed to generate a, a much stronger set of data and evidence. And that's, I think, something MOJ can build on now. And some of the activity-based costing work that goes on, for example, thinking about, OK, so how much does it cost to make sure these prisoners are 5% safer by doing this or that? And how much are we willing to pay for that? So some of that sort of thinking, getting that into public services, has been very, very powerful. Um, the other benefit, I think, has been very much reassessing you know, what outcomes you're trying to achieve and, uh, and the ways of going about doing that. I mean, the, the big libraries crisis that we all heard a lot about two years ago when everyone realized they couldn't afford to keep their local libraries open, a number of local councils thought about how they could deliver other services from the library or find other ways of making it add value. And, and I think some of those ways of thinking, forced out of circumstance, can be quite productive. And that, tends, that type of think, thinking tends to come to the fore when you when you do something different. Um, now, some of these can be gained by other processes that require a step back. Um, Watford only outsourced its uh, waste collection recycling last year, and you know, Watford didn't sort of completely collapse as an entity, uh, or whatever some people might think. And um, there are, there's obviously the, the benefit of the process that I haven't actually mentioned, which I really wanted to touch on, was actually the benefit of the commercial dialogue, bringing in someone else into this process. And I think the benefit there is opening up. It's exposing views and ideas that you have about the way of creating value to people who've got a different set of perspectives and experience. And it's just actually the opening up process. Now, it's tricky because uh, providers also have an interest in things that they're going to tell you. Um, but it's something that I think has, has been quite transformational for the departments that have gone through it. It's only one voice and one aspect of opening up, which we would highlight from our work on policy making, but is extremely important. It's also important to open up to users and communities, and I'll come back to that theme. So while we don't know about the value for money for gains overall in many areas, we do suspect there are some strong benefits here, even if you decide not in the end to go for a fully outsourced model, as, as some of you were saying. The risks, though, I think, are not to be ignored. I mean, one thing that we assume in the UK context is that when we're talking about innovation and new models, it is to do with externalization or whatever we want to call it, contracting out. And 
I think it's, it's useful to reflect a little bit on the private sector experience of going down that road. Um, not, some services are much harder and less appropriate to contract out than others. We've produced some research here uh, called when, when to Contract, which Nehal Panchamia, one of our researchers, led on. And it looks at the, the, the thing, it, what, is, what is the essence of the service that makes it easy or hard to contract? Because in some cases, it's very hard to measure value. And disconnecting the management chain that you normally have and creating a contractual break is very hard to, to overcome in those circumstances. If a service is very interconnected with lots of other services, as for example probation is, it makes it extra hard. And that's why you're talking about things like how do we make sure that PCCs and local authorities are also lining up behind this agenda to try and reduce reoffending because they matter an awful lot. So some services are much harder than others. So, and, and the private sector learned this to their extreme cost. So uh, Boeing had a very interesting experience where they, they, they make planes um, and they tried to outsource their, their fuselage, fuselage production. And they, uh, they found their supplier wasn't very good at fuselages. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a shame, but uh, you know, they had orders on demand. They had to produce planes for their customers. And they, so they, they thought, oh, this, this fuselage, it's a bit late. Um, well, let's, just, let's just chuck a little bit more money at them. Uh, let's see if that will fix the problem. We'll see if they can just get this, get this thing up and running. And they thought, oh, it's still a bit, still a bit slow. And this customer over here, so our reputation is on the line here. Ultimately, we'll go bankrupt. We keep stop, stop, don't fulfill the plane orders. So they thought, OK, we'll send some of our best expertise over to, uh, over to the, uh, the factory and uh, see if they can sort it out. Um, and unfortunately, the expertise didn't work. The culture was really toxic in the organization. It had real problems. They didn't seem to be really focused on actually delivering value for the customer. And they thought, oh, what are we going to do? We're locked into quite a long contract here. And what they ended up doing was, was buying the company. So uh, uh, I don't think they successfully transferred risk in that state. state. And <coughs> the reason they didn't was because what they were trying to outsource was too core to their fundamental operations and, and effectiveness. I think this is important to bear in mind. Uh, when services are more complex, when they're more core to operations, it is much harder to get this stuff to work, which is why I think in the UK it's good to look internationally and recognize that we are right on the fringes of what is outsourced and done in partnership with others, and to recognize that there will be risks associated with that, and doing this for the first time, those are significant risks. I think prejudging the model is therefore particularly difficult. Um, and I think also the other risk here is, is actually when you get into the negotiations, prioritizing commercial considerations and commercial viability of the model, once you get into that stage, over other views and other considerations, I talked about the value of opening up. Mm -hmm. There is also a value in engaging users, communities, and other actors. But once you get into a commercial dialogue, from what we've seen, it can be quite tricky to actually prioritize and value those users and communities, which is why I think the movements of the initiatives in places like Lambeth, where they're bringing in community groups to challenge around service reconfigurations, contracting models, are really interesting and need to be thought through because that is a big risk. The other risk, which Antonio referred to, is the need to ensure there is true competition here. We, we, we know the story of tagging. Um, to summarize it for you, uh, we, ha we have this as an MJ contract, so uh, forgive me, I'm not, not being accusatory here. It's a long time ago, there were a series of contracts with, uh, with two only two providers provided electronic tagging services in the UK. That doesn't look a lot like great competition for me. But once those two providers, Circo and G4S, get into trouble for billing ir irregularities and they get excluded from the bidding process, you only have one large provider who's willing to play ball. And that is a terrible negotiating position to be in and arguably should be a avoid competition. John referred to the final point, which I think we'll, we'll go into the discussion a bit, which is what are the internal like, changes and the skills and capabilities that, that are needed to actually make sure that these exciting changes actually deliver the results rather than being the Boeing example. Mm. And I think thinking about the capabilities of the civil service to deliver against this agenda is going to be incredibly important. And within that, I think what's interesting is to think about what central capacity and support there is around this. So we've got the, the new commercial models team. It's a, new in, it's, a, it's a new version, effectively, of some of the previous predecessor central units that we've had over the years uh, that have done similar sorts of things. And what is, the, what is a more sustainable model for having central capacity and support to people who are doing some really difficult things that can actually make this stuff work on the ground? Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. So some ri really rich themes coming out there. You've heard Ed talk about the involvement of the private sector and how we can use that as a catalyst. Um, he talks about the importance of, of, of differentiating between the shareholder and the customer within government. John has talked about trying to be more innovative within, within operations. How do you blend that public and private capability together? How do you incentivize the private sector better, put them on a more outputs basis? Antonio has talked about creation of markets and bringing in 
contestability. And Tom has laid some really good challenges about how do you develop the, the, the capability. I thought one, one question I'd like to ask, and perhaps, um, John, I can direct, direct this at you, really picking up um, the point that Ed made about, about differentiating between the customer and the shareholder. And it's really to challenge the extent to which the government customer is able to articulate properly really what it wants from these and how you define that. We've, we've talked about value and, and, and the difficulty of defining certain outputs, but do you think that is sufficiently well developed in these situations? Um, no, no, not particularly. I think it, if you go down these routes, it definitely fleshes it out. Uh, I, I think it's right that you do have to have a separation between who are the customers of the service and who's, if you like to use that language, the shareholder of the organisation. And we've done quite a lot of thinking. In fact, we were having a conversation uh, this morning about what's the separation between who owns this delivery organisation and make sure it performs. May not be the people who receive the who are the customers of that. And how you think about that is really important. And it definitely puts on the table, what do you really want to achieve? As Antonia said, what are you really trying to achieve and how are you prepared to pay for that? But I think the real, the, the significant issue for us is it also brings to the table how often you change your mind if something is already internal. If you mm. control something, you can change your mind every single day, every week, whatever. As soon as you enter into a contractual relationship, there's a cost to change. And certainly for us, mm. that's, that it's really brought that to life. How many times we were asking internal business units or arm's length bodies or whatever to, ch to, to kind of change between this level of service and that level of service, now we need a lower cost, you know, whatever. You've got a, now you're in a contractual relationship, there's a cost to doing that. And you've got to think about that really carefully at the beginning as well as through life. But for us, it's brought a simplification to that. It's avoided changing our minds all the time. And I think that's been really powerful. And perhaps, perhaps that's one of the values of that initial challenge as to what you want, <coughs> in that it causes the internal customer to have to consider that. Yeah, the, and to some, to some degree, I think what you also get to do is enter the market and say, we think we want this. Uh, what do you think? Yes. Because you, you're, at the minute, you're limited to what you know about the organisation and how you're thinking about it. And what you do want is somebody to at least have some room in a bidding process to say, well, actually, you might be able to get this. Are you prepared to move? Yeah, I, I, mean, I completely agree with that. It, it's got to be about the outcome. You've got to define, when you're looking at what, what your contract covers, you've got to be able to find some simple measures that are the things you're going to contract on. And they should really be outcomes, because that way you're testing. Uh, if you get the outcome right, you are trimming and changing your mind a lot less frequently, because you've, just, you've, you've determined that. And that's where, actually, things like... Um, Tom referred to how do you worry about... Um, uh, setting other sort of standards and who's got to talk to whom. For you referred to my mentioning the PCCs. The point is, if you go on the outcome, if you're paying by the results, then as long everything that should support that outcome should be being done. The risk, of course, is that you need. We can't afford to. There's certain areas, and justice is one where we don't want to take very much risk over what would be produced. So you've got to, alongside the outcome, have some really clear standards which you also contract on. But if you've got those two parts, if you're paying for outcomes and you also have some standards which must be met, then those two things together should allow you to, to manage the split between customer and stakeholder. One of the observations I make from the discussion today is that as uh, a number of models begin to emerge and come into the market and assessed and looked at more widely across government, um, in my interactions with civil servants, I often get the question of would a certain structural solution be appropriate, a joint venture, a mutual? And it's always seemed to me that that's, that's the wrong place to start, but I recognise that that's the language and, and, and the natural tendency to go to a, a structural solution. Ed, do you have any observation on, on that as an experience? I, I do. I mean, when I first came into government to take this role two years ago, uh, people said, well, are you writing the manual? You know, g g give me something so I can take it away and I can just work out the answer. Uh, and I resisted doing that because I don't think there is a manual that can actually cover all of these situations. What you need is clear objective thought, setting down what the objectives are, what the capabilities are, and therefore finding the gaps and the logical way to fill those gaps, and then finally fitting a model. But um, the tendency to reach for lawyers, first of all, and say, compare these three or four different structures for me um, is definitely there. There's a just link point on that, actually, which is that, um, I mean, one thing that is obviously an issue and, and highly aware of is when you are doing lots of different models for the first time then there are very high transaction costs in terms of senior management time often particularly if they've got a bit of political 
relevance and salience. Uh, they get they suck in a huge amount of management time. So if you look at some of the, the local government uh, mutuals, for example, they're very small organisations in terms of annual spend. Um, the benefits would never really justify that time. The question then that organisation needs to ask itself, <coughs> in my view, is, well, first of all, is, is it actually worth going down this road? But secondly, are we going to achieve other, some other sort of cultural change within the organisation that actually merits this, this hassle? Can we connect this to a wider agenda where this actually makes sense to us? But I think sometimes with certain types of politically driven initiatives to, um, to change delivery models for, for, the, for the benefit, the reputational benefit that that has, you can end up spending an awful lot of time in something that doesn't add huge amounts of value. One of the features of government that I've observed over the years is the um, ability to deal with entire markets, whether it's, it's railways or whether it's, it's proba pr probation. And the question, I think really for you, Tom, do you think there's enough consideration given to the evolution of those markets once they're created? So Antonio has talked about the creation of market and the benefits of contestability, but in, in previous working, as I say, whether with rail franchising or with the Forensic Science Service, where the market was opened up and contestability was brought in, was there ever enough thought given to the evolution of that market? I would actually, I mean, at the risk of being challenging again, I mean, the, the rail franchising evolution is interesting in some respects in terms of what we haven't learned from it. So one thing they did do is they, they sequentially con uh, did each franchise, each area of the country in order, learnt as they went and evolved and adapted their model for going to market. Um, that's not something we decided to do in probation, which would have considerably de-risked the, de the programme. Um, market, I think, still would be interested in opportunities of a certain size, a regionally based size, and that would have worked. Um, but in, in terms of thinking about market creation and phasing it, I think we're nowhere near there yet. And when you look across government, we're even further away because actually we regularly flood markets with the same providers mm. with huge amount of opportunities at mm. the same time, and then the pipeline completely dries up. It's very hard to coordinate that. And the, I mean, I'm sure that Edge could speak much more effectively than, than I could about the challenges of of cross-government coordination, but um, it, it does create real problems because you get areas of the country where people aren't bidding for a contract and you get other areas that are massively oversubscribed, so it's, I think there's yeah. serious, serious questions there. Antonio. But I can't allow, it would have considerably de-risked the programme to, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, live face. I mean, in practice, in, um, there are certain things that you can't do at, on a regional level, so extending, so turning on the statute that extends uh, rehabilitation 12 to 12 months is one of them, which is why phasing in that sense isn't possible. Where I do agree is that you've got to, is that insofar as you can learn from pilots, such as we've been learning from our um, Peterborough um, SIB, for example, or, or do other things, or shadow run in the public sector, such that you can learn um, about what you're doing in a sort of safer space before you extend it, I think is, is important. But I do, it does come back to, did you spend enough time designing the market in the first place and properly working with the market um, in order to ensure you have something robust yeah. there in all, in all your contract package areas? John, one, one last one, and then we'll, we will open it to the, to, to the floor. Um, in engaging with the private sector, yeah. um, th there's some balance, isn't it? All of these models have limitations. We're all aware of the history of rail track and coming back into the private sector. Sure. At the end of the day, uh, you have control over the MOD, and therefore, ultimately, you're the, the provider of last resort. H how do you strike the balance in these arrangements with the private sector to get the benefit, but not so far that you've, you've overstretched yourself? Well, I think you have to sit, sit down and just work through what all of your options are. So I, I agree with Ed. You don't start with, I want a mutual and work backwards. There are a range of options that are available to you. They'll all have pros and cons, and what you're trying to make is some judgment about those pros and the cons with the available evidence. And now if you're, if you're trying to break into a new market, sometimes you don't have that evidence. And therefore, you're to some degree, you know, you're just trying to make quite a tricky judgment. And then you get into a very difficult place of uh, what's the value for money judgment here when you haven't got any kind of decent counterfactual. Mm. So it, you know, in, in a sense, some of this is data driven, very rational, pros and cons, map it out, get whatever you can into a model. And then in the end, sometimes it's a judgment about, you know, our instinct is I've got 90% of the way there with the data, but I'm, I'm, we're going to go with that option. Mm. No, that's about as best as you can do. But everything's got some sort of pros and cons. You've just got to work your way through it. Some judgment and some risk taking. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong. There are no risk-free solutions, is my, is yeah. my take. Certainly yeah. I'm running the Ministry of Defence right <laughs> now. <laughs> and, uh, 
you know, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong. In fact, I've defended in the Public Accounts Committee a, a couple of times us, us doing something, trying to be innovative, it going, it not going quite as well as we wanted, and, and us correcting ourselves. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We, we, if we don't take any risk, we're never going to do anything. And sometimes we just occasionally we're going to get it wrong. We have to learn from that, and we have to then move on. Thank you. I'm not going to open up the discussion more widely, and I think we have a microphone. Could, uh, what I thought we'd do is if we take two or three questions in one go, and then the, the panel can hear those and be reflecting on, on the latter two while the first one's being, being answered. As, as you pose a question, could I t ask you just to say who you are and if you're representing an organisation, which organisation it is? So, sorry, gentleman at, at the back here, and we'll, we'll take two or three in one go. Uh, David Walker from Guardian Public. It's to sort of rephrase a, a question from Tom uh, and perhaps make it sharper. Why is it that the Cabinet Office seems to have been so reluctant to gather together the huge amount of learning that we could have culled over the expansion of outsourcing during, say, the past decade in local government as well as in central government, and if not write a manual, then be willing to have supplied to people who now seem to be oddly on the frontier when they might, on the back of previous learning, be a lot further down uh, a, a, a curve. And then even a role for the cabinet office in feeding back the learning to public managers who are confronting the options uh, as to contest or to compete out. It, uh, again, it's obviously before your time, but the cabinet office seems to be rather oddly passive as the manager of this extraordinarily interesting confrontation between government and private provision. Thank you. So, lady, lady down here in the middle. Thank you. Uh, is anybody um, able to give a quick view about the accountability future? Um, because uh, I haven't heard any word uh, in respect of that subject. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman down the front. Andrew Lickerman, London Business School, but relevant perhaps in this context, National Audit Office. Um, actually, my question links both of the previous ones. Um, two elements that haven't really come out are um, about the relationship between this as an initiative and what's gone on anywhere else in the world. And I just wonder how far we're at the frontiers here or whether we have experience already elsewhere, because that, going back to David Walker's point, obviously in terms of learnings, would be relevant, um, that's one element. The second is to do with the risk attached to this. And until John's last comment, I hadn't heard anything to do with Parliament attached to this. And we know Parliament is notoriously, in the form of the PAC, risk averse to things going wrong. And I wondered how far there'd been any consultation with them about the question of the risks involved in order to make sure this is about risk management rather than risk aversion. I mean, I yeah. know from the PwC, pamphlet you talk here about you know holding your nerve and um, danger of seeking to transfer too much risk so in terms of actually making sure that you've got parliament behind you it would seem to me it's quite an important dimension okay some really good questions there tom do you want to respond to the, the initial question about the collation of of learnings from what's gone before i mean it, it's it's not just in this area that obviously government struggles with um, knowledge management and evaluation and learning, it, it seems to be a, a tricky thing to do for lots of reasons, um, particularly in a politicised environment, but um, it, it does need to happen more. I think the, the, the other linked issue that I think that Dave has partly alluded to is I think the institutional churn at the centre, so the setting up and dissolution of, of units in, of different kinds in that cabinet offices in Treasury, and actually the, 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 the sharing across those two organisations of, of the support function around the new commercial model is I think a bit of an issue and I think it, coming up to the, 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 the 2015 period I think all parties need to think about what the actual what they now having had some learning over many years what is the preferred model for, of central support and challenge for this stuff um, is it to take the new commercials model team expand that allow it to cover other areas not just the new but also making what's existing work and function more effectively um, at, or is it uh, recreation of something like you know the um, uh, partnerships UK or, or, or other other sort of forms that we've had in the past? So, I mean, 
Just that first question, I think it is a very, very highly relevant question. Uh, it's one I have asked a few times, um, and you always get a number of barriers put up, um, what one of which, which is perhaps the one I struggle most with, is, well, we don't really know what the baseline is, so we don't really know how to compare it to what is done now. Um, you know, and part of that is, well, that calls into question the quality of the decision in, 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 in the first place. Uh, so I think it's an entirely valid point. So some questions around uh, accountability and uh, parliamentary lead on, on, on risk taking. Antonia. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'll just speak for transforming rehab perhaps first, which is, I mean, we, as I said, are, we're listening to everybody. So we'll, you know, we did quite a wide consultation and we've had a lot of um, interaction and ministers have a lot of interaction with parliamentary colleagues on this. Of course, we had the advantage of having the offender rehabilitation bill go through the House, now an act, um, and as a result, that generated quite a lot of debate over the wider series of reforms, um, in addition to just the, the fairly narrow um, aspects of what the bill delivered. We have actually also done, as you'll know, we've, we've been before the PAC, which is quite unusual for a programme which hasn't actually finished. I mean, we went, under to dis we went before it to discuss the probation landscape, but a lot of it was about um, the progress of, of the uh, programme. So there's been quite a lot of I would say, under shared understanding or, or, or learning the lessons from, um, from what Parliament in particular have said. And of course, we've looked at what other programmes have done. I might just say one thing that perhaps, if I may, uh, pulls together the first few questions as well, which is, the question is, what's the actual role for the Cabinet Office in delivering these programmes? Because, um, you know, I'm sure there would be a role for producing some guidance. And actually, you know, Ed, Ed's team and other teams do provide a lot of of guidance and support to departments in doing this. But at the end of the day, who's accountable? You know, the Secretary of State, or I mean, in our pro my programme, as SRO, I'm accountable for the delivery of its benefits. So the idea that there would be somewhere, someone elsewhere who would say, this is what you've got to do, you can't have that sort of split between accountability for the delivery of the thing and the design of the thing. It's got to sit in one place. So I think there's something about what the actual um, function would be. So sharing best practice, I'm sure can always be done more and, and would be very helpful, but instruction, I think, probably we would all agree less, less so. John? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I don't mind being instructed by the Cabinet Office on anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I have to get that in. <laughs> Look, I, I'll just, just pick two things and put them together. I, I think on accountability, your question, you've got to be absolutely clear about what accountability you're giving away. You know, I'm really clear that Secretary of State and I are accountable for the Ministry of Defence, but if you're going to do a deal, who's accountable for what, write it down, make sure you get it agreed, uh, and then everyone's clear about you know, who who's exactly is accountable for what. And in our case, we'd use tests like, okay, if this thing goes wrong, who's in front of who's in front of the Public Accounts Committee in the end? You know, and that can may well be the contractor that has to go with you, and you but you've just got to be really clear about it. The question about risk, in my introductory remarks, is what we're trying to search for here is to unlocking value for the taxpayer, and that value is either in re reducing the cost or it's in improving the performance or some combination of the two. And sometimes what you've got to be able to do is to think about it through that lens in terms of the risks that you're running. It may be that what you have to do is to take a riskier route to unlock further value, and it's part of your, I think, your decision-making equation. So yeah, I. I uh, was very positive about the two deals that we've done that have unlocked value, but equally we tried, we tested the market for cr the creation of a government-owned contractor-operated company to run defence equipment and support, and it didn't work. And that was a highly risky strategy from our perspective, right, but it could have unlocked billions of pounds of taxpayers' money, and it was a higher risk strategy that we took, it didn't work, and we've gone back to a lower risk strategy that I think will probably get us to... Um, the, the value creation in probably two or three turns of the handle over a longer period of time. So it's definitely part of the equation. And I'm absolutely not going to shy away from the fact that we took a risk, it didn't work, some funds were used in the pursuit of that, but if it had been successful, it would have unlocked you know, tremendous value. So I don't think there was anything wrong in public servants uh, searching for that. David's question, yeah, there should be some learning from people who went before us. Yeah. I had the great benefit of working in local government and I mean, done cut your teeth on street cleaning and waste yeah. disposal and all of those things, but that doesn't apply on a systemic basis, it just applies to me. There aren't many equivalents to DNS either, are there, in the market no. to look at? Well, so. there aren't any in the world. Yeah. So, you know, and, then yes. and that was one of the reasons why we consciously yeah. took a risk to try and innovate on a, almost on a global scale. It, it didn't work. Well, okay, you learn from that and you move on to something else.
So again, John, that's an interesting comment, isn't it, about internationally, um, are we at the forefront in this country looking at these things? Are there more learnings we, we could, could take in, in the military arena from, from the states or elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of, I'm not a, a world expert on outsourcing, right, but as I understood it, the UK is pretty much at the forefront of the outsourcing or the involvement of the private sector or the third sector in public services. We're pretty much at the forefront of that, as I've understood it. I mean, if you go to Germany or France or whatever, anywhere near the scale yeah. that we're involved in. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? The nice lady with the microphone. There's a gentleman right at the back, and then there's a couple, couple down here. We'll, again, if we take three questions, and we'll... Uh, Craig Baker from the Boston Consulting Group. Um, clearly, there are a lot of trade-offs to be made in, in making these calls as to how and when to to go to the market. Um, and I agree with John's point that uh, ultimately you have to, you have to take some risk and, and, and jump, otherwise you, you'd never get anywhere and never make any progress. Uh, however, I think there is a, there is a very important need to uh, learn from the experience of the past, like David and Tom have said, and also to understand uh, just how to use the private sector to innovate. Uh, and it's not the same organizations in the private sector that uh, are good at bringing uh, high levels of innovation uh, as those who are good at running uh, machines uh, and reducing cost and squeezing costs out over a long period of time, which is ultimately uh, what you typically look for in many of the service providers. Um, and uh, I think uh, there are cases in the past where uh, government has confused uh, those two. I've been I've been involved in this stuff going, going right back to the early days of refuse collection and street sweeping uh, and competing for quality. Um, and uh, you know, I've, seen, I've seen good deals and bad deals and, um, and, and, you know, and also deals where the private sector have taken super profits uh, because the, the government has not known uh, really what it is, what the opportunity is mm. and has outsourced stuff too quickly. Uh, the private sector has made the same mistakes um, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't absolve the uh, uh, government from, from learning from its very long history. And uh, as others have said, you know, we are at the leading edge uh, globally in this uh, and continuing to push the boundaries and, and uh, probation is a classic example of that where we're doing something which no one else has done before. Thank you. I have a couple of questions down, down this corner. Thank you. Alan Bailey, Permanent Secretary of Transport a long time ago. Uh, and um, I'm very interested in this being carried forward into the bigger areas, the new model, the, the infrastructure, MOD infrastructure, John mm. Thompson has been uh, piloting. Uh, because um, it seems to me that it works, the, the presumption is that there's a, a steady flow of, of government business that you can specify outcomes and you're going to manage that business more uh, effectively and that in that kind of situation this clearly can clearly work very well uh, but um, my experience is that politicians change their, their objectives rather often and s external circumstances change rather often and my last public sector exposure to this was in London Transport where we had a, a public-private partnership with mounds of contracts to specify what we expected uh, from the um, P, the P firms contracting to run the, the, the lines uh, and um, uh, uh, we transferred the risks. We were paying for the risk transfer but when things went wrong it was clear that we hadn't transferred the risk. Risk transfer is not in other words a, a, a zero-sum game. You're, mm. you're still mm. stuck with a lot of the risk mm. and, and, and if I'm right to take John Thompson's example um, it, it's fine running, asking um, contracting firms to run uh, infrastructure management until something like Scottish independence crops up and, and a huge amount of management time has to be devoted to real changes in what you're trying to deliver. It's the Boeing example over again. Thank you. The gentleman right behind you. 
Hello, thank you. Yes, uh, John Fairclough uh, from the Cabinet Office. Uh, just a question about uh, where all, all this is going, really. Um, having sort of lots of, sort of interesting examples of uh, I innovation, and sort of as we hear about how the economy, ec economy is growing, it's coming from lots of small enterprises, very nimble, highly networked, coming together around opportunities. Uh, and I just wonder whether you know, that is the direction for, as the title suggests, you know, the way to working for uh, Whitehall in future, and what the uh, um, outlook is for large departments. Thank you. John, would you like to comment on the, on the points made about when to go and the transfer of risks? Since, uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, I think, um, Alan. You're emphasising absolutely one of, the, one of the downsides, if you like, of getting yourself into a long-term contractual relationship with someone. So... One of the downsides of that is if you want, if there's a you know a change of, of the political landscape and you want to take a different direction, then you may well be locked into a long-term deal that's doing X, and you and I want to do Y, and how do you move from X to Y? That is definitely one of the downsides of it. Um, one of the upsides of that is we can then you can be very very transparent about what the cost of that change is. Okay, you want you want to change, that's fine, but we're locked into a contractual environment. It's going to cost you X. Now, that, I think, would have been somewhat more opaque if it had remained within the public sector delivery landscape. So, so you know, this is part of your kind of pros and cons. I mean, in our case, what we've, what we've tried to do on infrastructure is we have, we've essentially uh, done a management injection. We have not transferred the underpinning assets. They remain with us. Um, and you haven't gone all the way to an outsourcing with the asset transfer. I th that was, for me, when we did that risk analysis, that was way too risky. That was, uh, we'd gone too far, but we took some steps down a route of unlocking some value. And I think it's appropriate that you can take some steps, see how that works, and then you can take some further steps. So if you go to DBS, which we think is a very successful example, we're halfway through that contract. We're just sitting back and saying, well, what do we do with this thing next? Should we now take a, f a further innovative step? down that route, which might unlock more value uh, over time. So it, it's a question of you being reasonably controlled and alert to what the pluses and minuses are. You're absolutely right, Alan, that that is definitely one of the minuses. Antonio, you um, I, Yeah, I mean, clearly, ideally, the contracts that you're signing up to in your long term, um, the, the outcomes you're signing up to in your long term contract are things that will not uh, change too much with the electoral cycle. I mean, and. And for a lot of things, I mean, you know, in my business, reductions in reoffending is something everybody would want, so, so it makes it easier, and then the, the issue becomes about how you deliver it. But, uh, I mean, clearly that's a, that's a challenge. I mean, this is linked to the point, the fact of the long-term contracts is, I think, linked to the, the final point, which is you know, we're going to be tied into these contracts. I mean, there's no doubt that um, the, the way the world is moving at the moment is that the more business is going to be contracted out um, than was contracted out 10 years ago. But that's been, and that's been a long time coming. I mean, we talked about the prisons and, and provision of private sector provision, uh, prisons, which has been um, a 20-year programme, if you like. Um, I do think that there's something about how the sort of skills the civil service is going to need to do this, which is why we've got to, you know, commercial skills, digital skills, programme management skills, commissioning skills become much more relevant and important as the model for public service provision changes. And we do, large departments do, I think, increasingly become big commissioners. Um, and I completely agree with Craig's point, you've got to know who you're looking to to do what um, in the provision. And, and as you, Craig, will know, in, in the rehabilitation world, we believe that it's actually the voluntary sector that will come up with a lot of the most agile and innovative ways of working because organisations like St Giles Trust, that's what they do. They work very closely with offenders and they, um, and they have great results and then they look at how they can change their model because they're on the ground locally. So you've got to know who you're looking for to do what, I think. Just, just bear with me one moment. If I could just hear from Ed on, on the, the question about the longer term view to pick up what Antonio was reflecting. Yeah, I, I'll just make one comment on the previous two questions, first of all, which is, uh, I mean, a, a lot of the new models are about increasing flexibility. So to an extent, the comments so far have been about outsourcing, and yes, there is going to be more outsourcing. The question is whether we can make that more flexible so it can <coughs> deal with bumps in the road and forks in the road, <laughs> which inevitably will, will come about. In, in terms of vision for what it looks like, um, I mean, th there's a lot of talk about SMEs, and I always try and remind people why, wh why we like SMEs. We like SMEs because quite often they're innovative, 
We don't like SMEs in of themselves. You know, a large company which is innovative and able to deliver a service is fantastic, um, but sometimes we have to look elsewhere for that innovation. The type of market we're trying to build to the risk point in the many situations where we can have a multitude of models and supplies, and where we can, we ought to do that because it's inherently less risky. There are some situations where that's not going to be viable and we're going to have to you know, get to the 90% and jump, uh, uh, as John said. So yes, a multitude of models. Um, we're not looking for um, something which is inherently linked to SMEs, we're something which is linked to innovation and continuing to drive improvement. Thank you. Can I go back on Craig's question? I'm sorry? Can I go back on Craig's Yeah, question? of course, please. I mean, I think the one thing that's worth, worth saying in response to Craig's point is, I mean, everyone knows that you should never outsource a problem, right? But that doesn't mean that the, the, the only option you've now got is to run it yourself. Mm. I mean, I think what we've been able to do is, is to run a huge range of options in between now. So one of the things that we tried to do is to say, well, I'll take this organisation. I think there's a better way of unlocking value. How do I make it match fit, change it, and then make another decision? And in on that journey, you're unlocking value. So that's mm. a good thing. But you haven't outsourced it you've got to take into account the risk and whatever. But, the, you know, the old, I think the old dimension of in, in and out is completely gone. Mm. That's my perspective on it. So many different shades in between these days. It's definitely worth thinking through for yeah. everything you do, which is not core to your business. Yeah. And the point was made earlier um, in, the, in, the, in the panel presentations around bringing the spotlight to bear on those activities at the outset yeah. caused by, by um, the possibility of transaction. I'm keen, keen to involve, involve others. A gentleman at the back wanted to raise a point, and then a couple more down the front here, if we may. Uh, Jonathan Slater, uh, John's uh, commissioning DG in the Ministry of Defence, um, where I currently manage the SOCO contract with, uh, under him for the back office function, previously negotiated the social impact bond contract that um, Antonio talked about, um, and worked with others in this room on outsourcing refuse collection and education a, a long time ago. And uh, in none of those contracts that I've been letting uh, has n sort of nimble, agile innovation uh, been um, the core themes. Uh, perhaps that tells you more about me uh, than it does about outsourcing. But probably because they're all statutory services in which, using Antonia's language, government still has quite a lot of standards uh, that it wants delivered, not just outcomes, because these are services which, you know, you can't afford uh, to fail children's education, uh, to take one example, even refuge selection, you really don't want it to fail. And so in the contracts that I've been letting, and of course there are very different sorts of contracts, but in these ones, um, the, the way I see the benefit of the private sector and the test of whether a new model might work is does it help us improve the capacity of the organisation to meet the challenges it faces, actually? A bit of innovation, okay, fine. A bit of risk transfer, sure. But in the end, it will be John in front of the PAC, uh, uh, and so you can't transfer all. The, you can't transfer as much risk as you like to, but you can buy in some management capacity. And in defence, you know what was so great about the contract that John let for Serco to for defence business services was that it just bought in some more management capacity. Yeah. Uh, that was going to focus relentlessly on delivering shared services. Whereas the sort of people you'd bring in to run the Ministry of Defence were probably not going to be the ones who are the world's experts in shared services, because they're going to be the world's experts in defence. Mm -hmm. So seen through that lens, where can you improve your capacity to tackle significant yeah. challenges, sort of can demystify the problem and, you know, cut to the chase? Thank you. A couple of boys down here. Uh, hello, Mr. Hello. Um, office, hi. Um, point really is just p picking up Antonia's point on skills and capabilities. I think there's a lot of talk about needing commercial skills in government, which I totally get. But I think is, is that not more a capability around uh, people who can act entrepreneurially in a public sector context, which is a slightly different thing. So I'd be interested in the panel's views on that. But also, what is the, conversely, what is the mirror image of what needs to happen in the private and voluntary sector in order to develop these new ways of working, new models of working with government? Thank you. Um, lady in front. Um, my name's Winnie. I'm from Civil Service World. Um, again, a question around skills and capacity in the civil service. Um, can all panellists comment on what they believe the biggest gaps or challenges are in civil service ca capability looking at delivering n a new service model, whether that's um, 
commissioning skills or designing of the models or digital, like um, Antonia mentioned, or fostering a good, strong supplier market. Thank you. Or, Re or really good else. point. Antonia, should we take those in reverse order since okay. you previously talked about skills and capability? Um, so I, I suppose if I were asked, I mean, you know, everyone would have different views of what the, the, the missing skills are. Um, I think there's something about iteration. I mean, it's about policy design with delivery in mind. I would say is, is one of the biggest challenges. So it's partly commercial skills per se. It's partly uh, you know understanding how to build a market or commissioning. And digital is clearly something which is um, still fairly embryonic, although a huge amount has been done, especially since GDS um, came in. So there's no doubt that there are lots of skills that need to be learned. But really, when you're trying to design a big uh, program, you're taking a policy idea. You're taking something that. Uh, um, that um, you, you know your minister wants to do, and you're trying, you're you're saying, how can we implement this? How can we make it implementable? What are the risks going to be? What are the challenges? What's the, how should we run this program? Um, and so I think there's something about being able to um, iterate between the policy or the model design and actually how it's going to embed, and then test it all the time and shadow run. That's what I would say is the is is the skill, and that comes down to being able to bring together commercial, digital, the policy thinking, the, the design that you talked about. Um, that's probably what I would say on that. On, um, well, in fact, if you want to do that one first, <coughs> I'll come back and something else. Okay. Ed, I was thinking perhaps we could, we could link the point about improving capability that was raised with this whole development of the private sector response. And I'm wondering to what extent you get broad approaches from the private sector interested in government wanting to respond. And how does that get opened up? And is, and is the private sector encouraged that government is a good place to be doing business and should be engaging with you in different ways? Mm -hmm. If I could just start with Jonathan's point around innovation, um, I think it's important to think about what we mean by innovation because there can be the sense that it needs to be unbelievably new and wacky and fantastic, whereas in fact, principally innovation in services is a large number of small innovations which add up to a material improvement. And I do think in most of the services that we outsource or put out into a new model, we still want that innovation and we can still have structures that bring that innovation there will be a smaller number of situations where there is something which is truly innovative um, in terms of groundbreaking and being a significant change. Uh, so, so therefore, I would argue slightly, you know, y yes, it's capability, but I, I think that is more aligned with bringing the capability to innovate in, in, in a small way in, in it. In terms of what we see from the market, so, uh, I mean, we have a far more developed diverse and lively supplier base than just about every other country, which is going back to the point that we are more leading in terms of innovation uh, and the way that we use the, the private sector. But that said, we have trained them in a certain way. Um, they are used to um, ideas being floated, taking a long time to come to fruition, um, long, expensive, painful processes to go through. So the sort of conversations I have with them, yes, there is always willingness, but there's always an element of guarded to, to, to that conversation. And I mentioned slightly in my opening remarks that there's certainly not an impediment to innovation and new ways of working, but they do need to trust what we're saying when we say that we're looking for that, and we have to be consistent and follow through on, on what we have asked for. Thank you. I'm just going to come back on, on Jonathan's point because he's absolutely, I mean, obviously I 100% agree that one of the advantages of, of outsourcing is that you get your management focus on the things that, you know, feel are most important to you strategically as an organisation um, and it's absolutely right. Now, Jonathan is the embodiment of the other bit that you also need to do though because I think the risk is that you say, actually, we don't really care about this stuff over here. It just needs, it's kind of just needs to happen and we forget about it. Um, and, his, and Jonathan's, of, of course, making sure that doesn't happen um, and is very reassured that it isn't happening, but that's actually the history that we've had to a significant degree. And until you fundamentally change the approach to the, of the civil service to ongoing improvements in value for money, ongoing managing commercial relationships on an ongoing basis, mm -hmm. then you're always going to still have that risk. And I think, obviously, we've, we've spoken before at the Institute uh, about the Treasury taking much more interest in value for money as well as simple cost, and I think that's an extremely important thing. Um, 
for, to happen to make sure there is much more focus on this, but it ha has to happen in departments as well. So I just think there's a risk of, of getting that focus on the deal, the focus on the new, which is a civil service natural bias anyway to a degree, and forgetting about the important stuff that Jonathan's doing in practice at the moment. Thank you. Can we ask? I'll, I'll go for Winnie's question. Uh, well, what we need more of is people who can think really clearly about outcomes, what we're really trying to achieve. How do I take that clarity of outcomes into some kind of mod conversations about models, delivery models, right, and what options might be available in, in that space and risk transfers? I mean, I don't think we've got a mature view of, of how you assess risk. And then how do you turn that into commissioning something and then lastly, but uh, you know, critically for me, how do I turn that into a stream of activity that gives me information that says, I've let this commissioning deal, is it working or not? Mm. Because mm. there's a tremendous, I think there's been a bit of a, a pattern, certainly in central government in the time I've been here, there's a huge amount of effort in letting a contract and then that effort kind of fades away because you all think that's done, but actually it's the delivery that's more important than the deal, mm. really and keep the commissioning skills on an ongoing basis and getting flows of information, incredibly important. Yeah, for me, the two things that critically matter for running the Ministry of Defence, people and information. If I can get those two in the right place, then I, you know, I've largely cracked running the Ministry of Defence. Nobody should ever really say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> if only life was so easy. <laughs> Thank you. We've just got time for one more question. I don't know if anyone has a, a burning question they've, they've not been able to raise. Gentleman here. Uh, Rob Gibney from Oracle. Uh, I was just interested in the governance of these uh, joint ventures, mutuals, and the other companies. How active a role the public sector or its representatives uh, take in those uh, organisations? Yeah. Um, so, so, in terms of joint ventures, so if government is retaining a stake in these entities or getting a stake in these entities. We take a very active role, but we take an active role as a shareholder. So in the ones that we've created in Cabinet Office, we have at least one non-executive director who sits on that board, and they have responsibilities for delivery in the same way as every other director, in accordance with their fiduciary duties, to the benefit of all shareholders. So absolutely, which is why I'm very, very keen on keeping that responsibility very, very distinct from responsibility of government as customer. We, we bespoke them all, so it rather depends on the nature of the deal, the underpinning contractual arrangements, and the underlying legal entity that's concerned. Depends what those are, and then you, bes you bespoke your governance around those issues. No, well, there's not really an easy answer to that question, is a good one. We're about at time. It's, it's been a very rich um, conversation with a number of themes. I'm, I'm not going to endeavour to summarise it, but I would like to thank the panel members very much for their contribution. And that's from all.